Yeah, so I guess a good start will be um, looking back at your uh, PowerPoint presentation. There were some feedback uh, from the presentation that perhaps we can start from there. Um, so when uh, I did look through um, the, step, the slide deck, uh, so let me just scroll to, maybe I can share screen so that we all looking at the same thing. Uh, let me see, share. Yep, yep, here it is. So this is the um the slide that I believe um most of you have seen from your previous presentation. Um, so looking at this particular slide, we can start from there. Um, so. Initially, when I had a chat with um, Michelle, we were the one thing that she did point out was more what is the problem that you are trying to solve, which is, I guess, we're referring to why people are not um, coming back after a day of running at least one job. That that kind of the conversation that that's how we started, you know. What what why it occurs? What is is it normal? You know what is what did they do basically? So while we're talking about that, um, I was thinking that very similar to Galaxy Australia in the beginning, we use language like the user, right? It's like one person, but it's actually not one person because this user can be different type of user, different role. Not just that, it could be the same person, but doing different tasks as well. So that kind of lead us into adopting this, um, the Alexia Lime Science Data Cycle as a framework to give us some understanding and insights of whether you are a person working on at different stage, working on different things. Um, how do you, where, where is Galaxy sit within this cycle? Basically, that's what uh, our UX team wanted to know. So, so it's pretty hard when we say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? We really want to say, what problem are we wanting to solve for which users? That will be giving us more uh, more context in that way. So moving along, if I can also say, so what about scope and scalability? So what we found is usually when we have user journey mapping layout, which I'm going to share with everyone, uh, how it looks like and how it lead into agile uh, practices and also user story. Um, and from there, we need to then prioritize what task, what is the law hanging fruit? You know, what can we do now and what can we do in the future? That sort of thing. Um, so that is what we want to, uh, I guess, that, that is what user journey mapping can provide us the scope of, you know, what we want to do. And then we, yeah, then we talk about the agile method, which is uh, to us is whatever user research data that we gathered, it's really uh, allow and helping the team to create user story, to then put it in backlog, to then uh, implement them, uh, not just, um, not just, the user story makes sense, but it's also allowing the team to line up things that when you want to, when you're working on certain component and if they're all related, it's good to kind of group them all together and implement them together. So one push, then all these little problem will get sorted. And that's really, it's something that uh, is useful to have, to have a story coming out from the user journey map. With this one, um, yep, so user journey 
it can be anybody, like I said, uh, it's just understanding each person where where they are at, at what stage and what sort of tool or things that they the touch point and the different pain points they're experiencing during this entire cycle. Um, and it's very important to understand the persona. So like I said, this one persona could be having um, uh, could be playing different role at different time. So, but it's still good to have like a person in our mind when we're thinking of a uh, certain function or certain solution we want to design for them. And allowing us to then interview those user that fit that profile and to get, you know, more um, relevant information out from them. So for example, if we say the persona is a uh, PhD student, then you know we will look for all PhD students to interview. But if the post persona is the lecture or the uh, bioinformatician, senior bioinformatician, for example, then we will interview those people. So it just helps us. So usually when we uh, at Galaxy Australia, when we want to talk about a user story, we have to be very specific in for a senior bioinformatician, I want, you know, they want to do this, or, you know, I'm a, I'm a PhD student and I want to do this so that I can achieve something. So, you know, so that story tell the developers as well as designers to understand that, you know, this is designed for certain people. However, saying that, um, we using user journey mapping, we be able to tell designing and developing one solution normally can help multiple persona, not just one. So that's the benefit of having them all visible uh, so that everyone is not going to have assumption or guessing. Uh, next, when we're talking about the, yep, the scope is, yep, that is correct. So we will, no, I usually like the odd number um, because if we have even number when you come to a point to being 50-50 and that will be quite difficult to <laughs> help us to make a decision. So normally if it's odd numbers, it will work better. Now in regards to, you know, uh, people say, well, five users that can represent everyone. But from my experience, that will be, as you go along and interview more people, you will start to see the pattern. You will start to see this actually belongs to the same group of people and then you group them up. So, and also the more user you interview, the more data you need to analyze, it will take longer time. So once we interview up to five people, six people, you start to see there is pattern emerging and that will help us to then identify who is who uh, playing what role. And uh, let me see, is there anything I need to answer here? Yep, no. Uh, yep, community of practice, that is correct. Next one, we want to talk about the content. Uh, yep, so <laughs> this is a, a good one, Michelle, about, um, yes, SUS, um, normally it is seems to be highly subjective and it's correct. However, it needs to actually apply in context. We are not randomly asking people to randomly doing the SUS survey at any point of time, but it's always follow on from after we test with them on certain thing, whether it's a features, whether it's the page or um, mock-up, we then ask them to do a SUS survey based on that experience just happened and they will be scoring based on what they just experienced. Um, so 
that means, yes, we are asking the same 10 questions every time, uh, but it's in that context. So we normally attach those data behind whatever we were testing at the time. And very important, this is a very important exercise um, I've introduced to BioCommons because uh, previously they have done uh, quite a bit of, because um, we have an enge user engagement team. So they have engaged with users. However, they don't really have a framework or method to collect and store this sort of, um, I guess it's very high level, but it gives you a very good indication on whether have you done well as it is now and have you improved or actually you have done bad, badly this time, you know, so it is very good to, you know, give us this kind of instant feedback. It's just a very quick and dirty way to give you feedback, really. Um, so the next one is, yep, this is the user journey mapping uh, process. We want to understand at each point, doesn't matter what role you are, you will have to have a planning stage, like for even for designer ourselves, you know, we got to plan, how do I want to start doing this design? What do I need? What software do I need? You know, that sort of thing. Who do I need to work with? So all these are planning stage and then collect stuff, uh, the process, that sort of thing. So this cycle really can apply to a lot of um. Uh, 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 a lot of practitioners can actually apply this method. Um, so likewise, um, being a life science researcher also uh, fit the bill in that way. Um, so let me have a look at the feedback. Um, so it says, sounds like our on-site interview prevent us from only understanding the journey from a single communication channel and will instead show us where the user journey actually starts. Yeah, before the user open up Galaxy. Yep, that's right. So from the minimum and maximum number list underscore, what is the mix of remote interview versus on-site interview? Um, I don't really, I don't really understand that second point. So Michelle, if you want to maybe elaborate a little bit about what is the minimum and maximum numbers listed underscore. Sure. So under the, assuming we have five user interviews, what number should be on site versus remote? Uh, all of them um, in general, or ideally maybe all of them? Mm, no, nah, it doesn't have to be. It can be all of them off site, could be all of them face to face, could be, you know, some online and some face to face, because it doesn't make any difference. Uh, we use Mirrorbot. Um, in the olden days, before, <laughs> before pandemic, we used to use whiteboard and sticky notes and sit the user in front in the room with us and just, you know, put sticky notes on the whiteboard. Uh, but nowadays, a lot of things are digitalized. And so we just we use Mirabot, which works the same like a whiteboard. Uh, I will share with you how that uh, user journey map look like. Uh, and the, we send the link to the user, we're all online, and they can just in in real time, typing, putting their notes onto the mirror board. Um, but yeah, I will show you that screen in a minute. So yeah, in regards to physical thing, yeah, it can be offline, online, doesn't matter. Um, this one, um, yes, so we do have already, we, we do have a lot of user research, uh, I'm not sure about website analysis. analysis. Um, however, we, I must say we being, I joined by a comments um, last year. So it's a very short time frame. However, we have achieved a lot with Galaxy Australia. We had Maddie at the time. She was the UX designer only working on Galaxy. So she was trying to do more user research and more UX type of work. However, there were mis um, I think people easily misunderstood um, user experience designers actually 
UI designer. <laughs> and so she ended up doing quite a lot of like, you know, doing design, but without any evidence supporting, you know, why are we doing this? Why, why, uh, how do you make a decision that this design work? Is it based on someone's opinion? Is it based on someone's, uh, you know, subjectively decide, yeah, I like this design, you know, so on. But since then, I joined, uh, spent a bit of time educating the team and also the mainly the stakeholder as well as the decision maker in regards to um, user experience practices. And because uh, if we get it right, everything we do has evidence behind it. And it's not based on my opinion. It's not based on because I'm a designer. So, you know, I think this look great. Uh, it's purely based on how users understand what we're doing, what understand the design. And is that really uh, helping them to either navigate or uh, finding things that they need to find. That really is the objective. So in regards to aesthetically, we can make the previous website if people kind of not sure how to navigate, visually it looks great, then it's actually not functional and it's not functional. So therefore, you know, that's not what UX is about. Um, yeah, so in regards to since I have joined, we started having uh, a central location to store all of our user research data and not only just Galaxy, but also all the other projects that I'm involved with within BioCommons. And that where Maddie being the UX designer can also see how the other platform uh, work and at what point even those users actually do use Galaxy. So, you know, it, it's one of the journey prior to them landing onto Galaxy Australia. So to her, um, it's really good to have the UX designer overarching, seeing the whole thing, um, to have that understanding and insight. And um, great, is the outcome measure, measurement particularly when using, okay. So yeah, in terms of the century click tracking, uh, Michelle, do you want to elaborate that point a little bit? Oh yeah, um, this is just to say that um, having or seeing some of the, the data that's stored centrally on the user uh, interviews, the user personas that might've been created uh, for Galaxy or just generally speaking, I think would be helpful for the different Galaxy teams to, to see and have access to as opposed to necessarily starting from a blank page and doing all you know our user interviews from scratch. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that's a very good point to make as well. So yeah, Sentry, uh, more like some sort to like Google Analytic where it, it tracks what's the users, uh, the activity the user make within the site. However, you know, like like we know, it's just uh, it's it's quantitative, and we we don't know why, and you know, but we have figures. So yeah, it is good to marry this sort of um user research with the quantitative data to give it more insights. That's definitely would help. Um. And okay, so user engagement should be multiple engagement type based on product service doesn't need to be to be and may be possible to have an existing standard user engagement value in biological science like may be possible in other fields industries. Um, yeah, so user engagement, should be based on products and products or services. It 
the reason being um um they stand sorry the sorry do I have an assist exact sorry exacting standard user here okay um yeah user engagement does do need to be a uh, engaging with the same with the right mm -hmm. I guess with the right person or group of people it's really it's not going to give us good insight or clear indication if we're talking to the wrong people um, and that's what lead back to lead back to we need to actually have persona in our mind that would then help us to do the engagement um yeah, okay. Suggested engagement type for Galaxy. Finding a history, running a job. However, rerunning a job shouldn't be considered alone because job may not be, may not have run successfully. So should include planning for errors. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this is this point is a very interesting one. But let me have a look at the feedback. How many users did something in a month? What portion of user ran a workflow? Is there a heat map on the site to see what portion are being clicked? Uh, or user import workflow, user running tutorial. Okay. So to me, quite a lot of the, uh, beside the first one, how many user did something in a month? I think the second and the last point, um, they are uh, they I think they can be tracked by having you know something like a century some sort of you know tool that you can track whether you know heat map that sort of thing is fine if we want to get that, that kind of data. But the first question is something that we will have to be interacting or engage with users to actually find out that, you know, what how many users did something in a month, but what something, what is it? Is it just come in, uh, actually run a job or is it, yeah, is it coming in to find what they had done last time and then they left? you know, that sort of thing. So it's um it's it's hard to find this sort of data by using technology at this point of time, but we can definitely do it when we actually have that right persona in mind and include those as part of the question to ask them. And yeah, when it comes to user research and user interview, it's very, very important to know how to design the questions. Uh, which I think later on we're going to touch on some of that point. Um, okay, user persona. So overall, I said possibly that user in a biological science often have a lot of pain points that they have to get over. And so by the time they get to Galaxy, even a tiny bit of frustration is too much, which is true. Uh, I will show you the user journey map in a minute. Um, yeah, so high-end, mid-range, and newbie. So high-end is people who are very senior and uh, like Carolyn Hawk, for example, she is a very senior researcher, uh, but they are not going to be the hands-on people. And they but they are the one who set the agenda that is correct. Um, and so if people feedback to them that, you know, Galaxy is very frustrating to use, then that's not going to look good to us yet. So what we really want to please in this case is the newbies and the mid-range people because they will be the one who feedback to the high-end user, which is a decision maker that they should be using Galaxy, Calvin Hawk, for instance, because um, she's not she's not 
the one who used Galaxy, but she have heard good things about Galaxy. So we need to make sure people keep saying good things about Galaxy to her. So we really need to please the newbie and the mid range. Um, so let me see, is there anything I need to give, I need to answer with the feedback. If you're doing genomic every day, you're not going to be gal using Galaxy. Will you use HPC instead because of, for example, once you have that in your own environment, it's easier on your own system. That proven to be true today. Um, when I interview a, a lot of senior bioinformaticians, Due to, I was working on the TSI project. Uh, so I have access to really senior bioinformatician who is helping uh, people like Carolyn Hawk uh, to do data analysis or genome assembly. That's our job. They do, they do not use Galaxy. However, if we make Galaxy good, then they will want to use it. So it's just a matter of really having more chats with them, uh, doing more exploration with them to see how we can help them. So they, from their view, they do see Galaxy as a good tool for the startup, for people who want to become bioinformatician, they would recommend, yeah, try Galaxy. They're pretty good. They got a lot of support and things like that. But once people start to know how to do stuff, and they will probably ditch Galaxy. But that's not what we want. We want to keep them. So this is where the opportunity for us. How do we keep them? <clears throat> and so can we get some of the user retention number for Australia and EU to compare contrast? Hmm. Best, best line would tell us that we have different types of user between the two hubs. Yeah, I think... I think there will be something that I'm interested to see as well. Um, at the um, GCC in Brisbane, I had a chance to talk with some of the EU team, uh, particularly someone from working in the hospital space. And um, I'm, look, I'm, I don't use Galaxy, so I have no idea. And um, yeah, they were saying that, oh no, ours one is all customized. So that, then I just, I then realized that is that there are another type of users that Galaxy has, which is, you know, they're completely on their own um, Galaxy. So it can be actually customized more than, for example, Galaxy Australia. Um, so the idea Galaxy user may in fact be an entire entire lab, not just a single scientist. Um, yeah, yeah, it could be, and it, but it does it will require quite a bit of a, a studies to understand exactly how many departments are there within the lab, uh, and then we can deliver it, uh, to help each department. So yeah, it can be as big as we we want it to be, really. Um, so the next slide will be talking about technical work. Also, so I feel the entire site redesign are not usually necessary to generate high return. Yes, correct. Um, the majority of work involved is usually in the planning and coordination, not a complex, no lengthy technical implementation. Um, yeah, that is very true. So, yep, and then user interview. Yep, I do that. I just mentioned that, you know, Galaxy is for beginners. A lot of the senior bioinformatician do think that uh, for high end user, they will use Galaxy as training tool, which is, I would say, 95% of the time, that's what I heard <laughs> and actually have seen. Um, okay, so we want to. We want to see some quantitative analysis on Galaxy Australia during the community where it will be cross-team, cross-functional. Okay. Um, we will try to see if we can get there, the sharing the quantitative analysis. Uh, as I mentioned to Michelle previously, is we our study was studying on the Galaxy Australia interface. 
Um, and if that if you find that could work and would help with different if you are using the new UI, then yeah, I'm happy, de definitely happy to see if we can uh somehow uh see if we can cross check the quantitative analysis whether it will be helpful. Um Yep, so come back to the redesign. Yeah, no, I definitely don't think most of the time we need to redesign everything uh, unless it prov it show us a very good evidence showing that, you know, we really need to redesign because nobody is touching this page. Something seriously wrong here. Then, yes, we will have to do something. However, very often we will find when we're talking to user, particularly a site, like a site like Galaxy, it has traffic, but it's which area do we want to improve? So we will talk with the user to then eventually we found out sometimes it's just the labels. Sometimes it's just the icon didn't make sense to them. So, you know, it's just simple improvement, simple hint, and things like that to help them that would really help. I will also show you some of the thing that we found. Um, okay, user interview. So I feel strongly that on-site interviews shed a lot of lights. Yes, on cha on challenges user in user face for uh for software in the biological science field that we should allow to interview on site as well. Yeah, so I did a few study, basically following around, following the researchers around for a week. Um, I went to Sydney, went to Brisbane, uh, went to museums and follow, uh, follow those uh, researchers around and also bioinformatician to see how they work. And so I have some ideas. So by the time when I interview them, um, you know, sometimes people are nice. Yeah, they're nice. So they will look at the using the site and they will give you some really nice feedback. Um, but we really want to get into the negative side of thing because you know, knowing all the good things not gonna help us. We really want to want them to tell us the problem. And so when you are face to face with them you can see the body language you can you can sense that whether they're just saying it because they're being nice um yeah so often people do say one thing and then do another um my experience was one time doing a you user interview on this is for another site another project um Ask them about, you know, this is a very, very long and big table on the web page. And we ask the user, do you have any problem using this data? And they say, no, it's very good. It's very easy to find. See, everything is there. So we say, okay, so how do you find what you want? And they will use the browser command F to find what they want because the table did not come with a search tool or a filter or sort. So they just use command F and that's how they find them. And was, that's when we went, okay, okay. So there's a problem here, but yeah, but they, they accept it. They say, well, it's fantastic. There's no problem yet. So that's why it's very important to look at them. How do they do things? Um. All right, could we find a way to see what tool they were using before they got to Galaxy? Okay, so we can, um, but we need to know who are we talking about? Uh, you know, it's different persona. They come from different, um, they come from different pathway and, um, you know, but we can definitely find out where they come from. This is why we have that um, data life cycle to help us during planning. What do you do? But not everyone doing the same thing during planning stage. If it's Carolyn Hawk, she will be doing very different thing compared to Kate 
who is a senior bioinformatician that worked for Carolyn Hall. So, you know, yes, we can definitely find out what tool were they using. Um, can we hook up Sentry to get user journey information similar to what Australia is doing? Uh, we can explore that uh, if Sentry has, if you know, you got, you, if you have expert in using the application to know how to set the um, setting, I'm pretty sure we can some uh, we can get some. I wouldn't say hundred percent, but we definitely can see if we can uh, modify it a little bit. Um, who is Wendy Bacon has offered to have newbie experience from uh, let people do fantastic. Look, if we have access to uh, one, one or two or three types of a uh, persona to interview, um, that is really a bonus. This is one of the biggest challenge for UX designer is to recruit users to interview. And this is very good news if you have access to them. So to the sign of connecting the work BioCommons is doing to measurable outcomes, sounds like it will help them produce more quantitative data for us as well. Yes. So yeah, that would be good if we can work together, if we can supply you the quantitative data. Um, any questions so far or is it okay the way it's going? Anyone? Oh, I would just say, um, I think, at least, uh, well, a couple things. One is um, anyone that has feedback uh, to uh, feel free to type it in and I will add it to the slide since some of uh, the other Galaxy hubs have not seen this before. And um, I would say on the from the US Galaxy team, we're really excited. I know we only have 15 minutes left to see um, some like real life example of a Galaxy Australia user journey, for instance, or... Mm. Um, you know, the actual names of some of the user personas that you guys have uh, found from your research or something that was used in a real scenario since we're yeah. theoretical. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I just want to follow that up. Yes. So yeah, how about, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't want to go through all this slide, but what I'll do is I show, I show you how the user journey map looks like. So what we did was we literally, this is mirror board. So we'll create this board and we have the uh, cycle, the stage up on the top. So we got the planning, if, I, if you can see. So we got the planning, collecting, process analysis and preserve, share and then reuse. And then we, on the, on the left hand column, we want to know uh, what sort of job need to be done at the planning stage, at the collecting stage, at the process stage, and, and go on it, apply throughout. And then the touch points, what do you use? Do you need to contact someone? Do you need to use email? Do you pick up the phone? Yeah. Do you physically have to travel somewhere? So all this we want to know. And then we want to know what is the objective? What do they want again? During the planning stage, what do you want to achieve? You know, so for the senior bioinformaticians say, I want to know the brief. It's very important for me to know the brief so that, you know, I can uh, produce, you know, quality outcome and things like that, for instance. And then during collecting stage, you know, what do you want to achieve? So on. So it applied throughout. So they will then step us through, walk us through the journey. <clears throat> and then during planning stage, you encounter any pain points, you know, any frustration that you think is a challenge, you know, appear all the time, there's a situation. So again, they will walk us through every stage. So for example, planning stage, they might say um, from one of the, this is researcher, they're not bioinformatician, they would say it's very frustrating when uh, they find a piece of um, sample you know, a piece of ear, for example, and they'll need to bring it to a sequencing company to get it sequenced. 
And then what they found out was that um, there's a long queue, for instance. So, so there's going to delay their project and things like that. So we want them to tell us, although although the initially uh, the project manager is saying, how is that help us? Why do we want to know this? We said, because that's the journey from the users, things that is hidden we didn't know about. But during this process, they're planning, they're collecting, and then they're, the process, and then the analysis. That is when you can see Galaxy start to appear there. And you can see that they've already gone through quite a lot before they get here. So if they get to the analysis and then preserve, and then share and it's more pain point, more frustration. And then that is when we know, oh, okay, we're going to make it a bit easier for them because they're already quite frustrated. <laughs> you know, that's that that kind of uh, thinking. So as you can see, this one is an um, for example, we're interviewing a bioinformatician from an institution. And then we also, in the end, ask them, how do you feel after, during that planning stage, after you have gone through all these, you feel pain this way? Do you feel that you're hopeful? Do you feel that it's helpful or, you know, productive or neutral or frustration or stress? As you can see here, these are the words they put on the user journey map. Likewise for another bioinformatician and things like that. So from this data, we then analyze it, unpack it, we'll then create something like, we store all of our research in Confluence and we do a report. So this is for the UX designers, this is our space. And so we can use this information to do presentation or we can also print it out as a PDF as well. Um, so here we'll, we we want to talk about why do we do this thing? What are we doing? Why, why do we need to do this user research? Because we want to understand the data life cycle. And then we also, before we start interviewing the end user, we actually talk with the team and stakeholder decision maker and get them to tell us um, what were the pain points and area for improvement of Galaxy Australia. They tell us first, you know, they will have assumption, that sort of thing doesn't matter. We just put them on mirror board again, sticky notes. Um, and then these will then help us to frame the issue so that we can we can then test our, this assumption and we can then um, ask the user what do that tell us about our services you know, it frame so that we, we know uh, we're not going to be off track and ask random questions. So there's actually something that we want to find out. So from that, we will then use user journey mapping. But this at this stage, it's not, we don't have like an agenda when we do user journey map. The agenda is literally want to understand where did you come from? What did you do? And then where do you want to end up? Um, yes, this, this is the participant. So we uh, pick five people. No, it actually not pick. It's, we only can get five. <laughs> and uh, so this is high level characteristic of our uh, participants. So we will say a bioinformatician and then e-research analyst and uh, computational biologist and PhD student. And then from there, we, we have another uh, another document to show the drawing of the persona, but that is really to, for the team to share, just so that people can remember, you know, like I say, I use superhero, so people can say, oh, the, the Spider-Man and, you know, the Batman. So rather than trying to remember names and things like that. So there's many different ways to create the persona. Um, but let me just skip through very quickly. So this then, we we start with talking about pen points. Like we said, we want pen points. No pen points, I will have no job. So pen points. So Galaxy to create pen point across the research life cycle. So at the planning stage, there is missing tools, 
This lead to the user being unsure of whether their tool of interest can be installed on Galaxy. This often will require the tools team to look into the matter and this create a time lag and uncertainty for the user as to whether this is a visible option. And then at the process stage, um, issue with the tool search and users said to, so the, the tool search is broken. Um, and additionally, there is concern that also older tool will not be compatible with more modern data and also too often just didn't work and were broken. And one user also stated an unsupported live type, file type, let them to have to convert the file using a tool outside of Galaxy and then port it back into Galaxy. And that's quite annoying. Um, yeah, and then at the analysis and analysis stage, user said the issue with memory re limit associated with tools is a pen point. Tools not working as expected and having to troubleshoot. Or one thing is the error message not being clear. People do find it, it's okay to have error, but if the error message not making sense or not telling them why and what else can they do, it's kind of like, you know, it's not helpful. Um, and then additionally, unavailable, unavailability of certain tool was reported as an issue at this stage as well. So yeah, if, if tool if two sometimes not working and not there, you know, it's kind of create this uncertainty. Like I'm not sure whether it is not there or it is not working. Um yeah, so the the history, this is Galaxy history are creating pen points, particularly at the analysis stage. It was referred back analysis stage is that stage is in the life cycle. So it's this area, like we said, that is when Galaxy appear. Um, yep. So the his the history, what sort of issue, what sort of pain point? Well, is selecting the wrong data. Uh, the issue with selecting the wrong data from the history, therefore getting a result that is wrong and is confusing to the user. Um, they also doesn't. If a user doesn't rename files in their history, it can get very messy and confusing, which is, um, I'm sure if you haven't noticed already, this has been actually mentioned quite a few times during the GCC as well. Um, it was noted that file name convention are a step, a steep learning curve for people. Yeah. So if it if if people can't find the file, uh, you know, it's it's very annoying, and that all come down to you know how do we make sure people name their files correctly? Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go through every point, but we have this report. Happy to share. I got PDFs as well, um, but I just want to highlight a few things like this, for example, you know, at planning stage. The data size, data transfer movement and security issue were listed as concern. And additionally, there are report blocker is obtaining resources with researcher not knowing who is who to contact about um, obtaining resources. Um, that is from the planning stage. And the, during the GCC I mentioned, you will see at even though at these various stages, Galaxy, if people want to use Galaxy, at the planning stage, the, the, it does pop out, but we need to solve this problem. So then it'll pop up more often. And if we become part of it, you know, it'll become a touch point and that's what we want. Um, but yeah, so this report will show you what we found. This it is really good. And what I want to quickly jump down because now we got six minutes is, well, this is also a list of opportunities. These are the opportunities from the user telling us you know, what do they would like to see? So these are very valuable. And then we have, uh, what I want to show you is, um, 
Yeah. What I want to show you is our recommendation, <clears throat> right? So all these, we got user telling us what opportunity they want to see. And then uh, they also give us some good question about, you know, tools we choose, to, how can we be more efficient in the tool we choose to wrap? What process do we use currently to prioritize this? But I think this is an internal question. Um, okay, recommendation. So we, we on the mirror board, once we identify all these challenges and problem, right here. So initially, we put them all sticky knot. They are all over this side. So we say pen points. These are all the sticky knot on Galaxy 2. Pen point for the history panel, all the sticky knot here. And then we work with the stakeholder and we work with the uh, decision maker in Galaxy Australia. And we say, okay, now we want to prioritize. These are the pen points. How do we prioritize this? then they will help us to move across. So for example, we'll say um, the pain point for short term, short term, what can we do right away? So they will pick which pain point from the tool, from the history, uh, from the information and data, and then put them here so that we know, okay, that's short term, easy. That's an easy all hanging fruit. We can do it now. And then we will and have medium term one and then we have the long term one right this is with the stakeholder so they can make that decision we ux can only provide you so much and then you can decide when you want to execute them now we then also make some recommendation so the recommendation is from some ui improvement side of thing once we can see and identify uh, the pain point that uh, body language and things like that from the users, for instance. And we will then make recommendation here. So feel free to um, um, have a look, but I can email everyone or provide you. I don't know if you have Confluence access, but I can definitely email you the PDF. So you can look at our recommendation. Now, some of this point we already sorted, right? So the particularly the short term one. Um, if if um Cameron's here or Garrett's here, you know, they will definitely point out which one we already um executed. So there are still some uh, midterm and the long term one that we haven't tackled. Um yeah, so so that's Basically, it's the report, which I have a PDF of. Now, in terms of also an on, this is an ongoing running um, <clears throat> user research questionnaire. And we want to keep collecting data of our user. So every person that we met or interview, whatnot, we send them this link and get them to give us the information, what domain they come from, uh, do they like this sort of online platform, how do they rate them, things like that. This is also some data that we can share. Um, and then we have, what else? Yeah, no, that's it. And yeah, so that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I got. So one minute to go, <laughs> no, no time for question. <laughs> This is amazing, Mark. Uh, maybe in the last couple of seconds, um, would I think this would be awesome to uh, see this uh, PDF copy of the report that you were displaying. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of very valuable um, findings from your research, user research. So we'd love to take a look at that and then also be able to kind of, uh, I think, pull some of the pieces of the process from that as well um, for any iteration of this that we might do on our side. Um, and then I think too, it would be great to see that form uh, that you just showed uh, at the end. Um, I think this might be a useful um, way to collect information and feedback from users on kind of the US and the Galaxy main side. Um, so we'd love to distribute this as well um, and possibly at EU based on Bjorn's comment in the chat. 
Um, and then maybe since I am talking already, I, I can ask maybe one question if you have an extra minute. Um, you spoke a little bit about how you convert these findings and how you take these findings and um, put them into the development cycle. Um, could you speak a little bit to that about how these recommendations kind of turn into action um, in terms of becoming addressed or fixes being made? Mm. Yeah, so, all right, I'm gonna backtrack here. So because we were working with, um, we being the UX designer working, well, as you know, we're a small team. So uh, working with Cameron and Garrett and also Nigel. And so they will have to make a decision on the, um, the whether it's the short term and long term. So what happened is, for example, if they, they pick to say, okay, we want to fix the tool search. It's a short-term thing. We can do it in the next sprint. So then this will then add as a ticket in the backlog. And um, it's, well, sometimes we have a BA. The person will have to write the um, user story in it. So that where is that user story come from? It has to be something to do with the user journey mapping. So that then feed into the story. So then it become a ticket. But for the more medium term, for instance, it may be either relying on, you know, the global side of thing, or if it's um maybe technology or a yeah or authentication, for example, you know, relying on the third party, then it may be a medium term, but it still will be end up in a backlog. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Um, any final questions? I know we're a little bit over time. There's something on the chat. Let me have a look. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> my question is a bit, we are running a lot of in-person trainings and is there anything, so is there anything that we can distribute during our in-person trainings to these users or is there anything um, that we should talk with those users? So essentially we have a lot of trainings and a lot of users that we train. What are these, let's say, most important 10 points that we should ask our users to enrich our data sets? Right. See, that's the key word there. Enrich your data set. Yes. yes. Right. But how so, to do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I mean, using this question, uh, that is not going to help you because this is this question is designed to understand our user type. But if you really have, it sounds like you do really have a burning question, you want to find out the answers. So you literally, um, I'm happy to work with you. We can come up with not much, five questions that will help you to get that data that's going to um, actually be useful. You know, not, not asking them, do you find this easy? That sort of thing that's not going to help you. So you really, uh, it, it's the matter of designing those questions, but it doesn't have to be many. It, five is quite a lot. And because your burning question is how, um, what was that about improving the data set? Is that right, Bjorn? Yes. So is there kind of, I don't know, a sheet of paper which we can distribute and people need to fill out something? Or is this the form that you showed that we should just send around and ask people if they can fill out those form? Is there something that we should, I don't know, stand behind our users and watch what they are clicking and then fill out those data, right? I'm, I'm just pitching you the idea that the Global Galaxy community has, I think, access in the in-person trainings, at least, to a lot of different kind of user groups. And we could use it to enrich your data set, right? I'm just not sure how to, and I would... I would need to have an introduction from you. What are the key points that I need to observe or or which of those materials that you have shown here? I, I mean, we cannot give them everything, right? This is a little bit overwhelming. 
But maybe right. the top top t ten questions which we could give them and really ask them nicely to fill that out. Those kind of things I think we can do easily. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I I think yeah. What what I'm showing you, if it, 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 whether it's a form or journey map or what anything else, it's it's the method. So like yes, it definitely you if you have you know you obviously have the um capability to have a lot of users engagement. However, we really want to know. We're not gonna just give them a form, but we don't know what's the form going to help the information we collect how is that going to help us so it is the matter of putting in some effort to make sure the piece of paper or the form we send out you know that is going to generate some useful data for you to answer that question that you have right so like yes definitely i can create a form but you're not going to you, you won't be using this form but we'll create a form that looks like this have only five or three questions those three question is the question that we will design to make sure it's going to provide you the answers you want you know what i'm saying beyond yes but i guess it's not me that want this right so the global galaxy or, or you in that sense i mean the ux team whoever that is wants to have that right yeah but do we know what it is that we want to know yes exactly yes yeah yes. <laughs> yeah so if we do know what we want to know but we don't know the answers and that is exactly the the question we're going to design yeah. to come up and then give it to the user every time you do your training you give them those five three questions yes, and then that... it will start to give you the quantitative answers yeah great cool excellent thanks a lot yeah i know we're a little bit over time thank you so much for this presentation i think there's going to be a lot of valuable um feedback we can take back and also i'm really excited to dig into uh some of those resources that you shared towards the end um, so thanks so much for your time thanks everyone for joining our call and we'll see you You're at welcome. the next one my pleasure thanks for having me i'll send you the pdf <laughs> wonderful okay. thanks so much thanks more bye 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 bye, Thank you. bye. bye.